welcome to the Catholic Cafe, where Catholic truth is served fresh daily. We've made you a reservation in the luxurious corner booth, so come on in and see what's on the menu today. Now, here's your host, Deacon Jeff Drzezemski. Greetings and welcome to the Catholic Cafe. I'm Deacon Jeff, sitting in the luxurious corner booth of the Catholic Cafe. Sitting here with Thomas Patrick Dorian. Yes, sir. And Sam Ziggy Rodriguez. That's me. Hello, Ziggy. So we are uh, we are here and we're continuing on a great series that we're doing. Uh, and these we're doing deep dives into the sorrowful mysteries yes. wow. of the Most Holy Rosary. So, well, yes, uh, well, you know, it's these are the sorrowful mysteries. Yes. Uh, and we're on the third sorrowful mystery. Um, yes, we are. And is that correct, Sam? We're on the that third? That is, yes. All right, awesome. <laughs> For those of you who don't know what I just did there, I was hearkening back to the second. L- last week, <laughs> okay, so I put together some notes, and they were about the second mystery. And he wrote third in there. But I wrote third. I wrote third at the top. I know. And, and, and me. We're well, never going to forget this. Me being the... <laughs> <laughs> Me, me being the simpleton that I am, you know, read everything that's put in front of me on the prompter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, so here is, uh, we are on the third sorrowful mystery, the crowning of thorns. Um, and uh, this is a, this is a really neat one. one of, and one of the things that we do uh, is we, there's like a, a, a fruit that we we're sort of pray that will be the result of our meditation or our pondering on this particular mystery, what, what fruit we're looking for. Sometimes there's a couple of fruits. Um, and this one, we have a, a a little bit of a unique fruit, as it were. It's like a, it's like a kumquat, you know. <laughs> it's it's a it's a kind of a dragon fruit. It's a it's a different kind of fruit. Yes. Tell us about this fruit. The helmet of salvation. See, as a fruit, I don't, I you know, when you first said that to me, it's like this is what I'm thinking, Deacon Jeff. And I'm like, <laughs> has has Sam's rain on the air come to an end is it possible that finally he's given in and is like something snapped uh and we got to sign some papers and send him off he said the helmet of salvation and then i started thinking about it and you were explaining it more i'm going like that what a cool fruit oh yay yeah so i I mean part of my morning prayer routine is i pray uh the to for God to renew me in the in the armor of God that we have in Ephesians six, and part of that armor is is the is the, the helmet of salvation. Uh, now Saint Paul, he doesn't explain in individual pieces of the armor armor of God. In a way, each ar- piece of armor is is its own little seed of contemplation. But when I was meditating upon uh, the crowning of thorns and, and asking God, you know, as we were preparing for this show, uh, Lord, what should the fruit be? That we're praying for as we as we reflect upon the uh, the uh, third sorrowful mystery. What came to me just crystal clear more than once, I, I you know, was the helmet of salvation, and uh, it, it's you know it's kind of it's kind of a if you think about it, it it's it's kind of a surprising to hear a link you know between the the uh, helmet of salvation and uh, the crown of thorns. It's sort of counterintuitive. Right? Yeah, it's definitely counterintuitive, and that's and that's mm-hmm. the thing that. Because typically, in a, if we were looking for fruits, what are the fruits of the crowning of thorns? It's like, well, uh, the fruit would be humility, uh, docility, uh, being willing to be tortured for your faith. I mean, essentially, you know, it, it, and, and so loyalty. There's all these different fruits that you could probably see here. And this is a this is a different kind of a way to view that fruit. Well, and also, I mean, if you think of a helmet. You know, I mean, you would typically think of a helmet as something that covers your head, protects you, not something where you are vulnerable, suffering pain, allowing yourself to be attacked, mocked, and yet, therein lies our salvation. Before we get ahead of ourselves, let's let's actually read that passage. Absolutely. So just, just to put us in context, and we're going back to, as Sam says, Ephesians, uh, Ephesians. Uh, chapter six, and and we're going to start at verse thirteen. We've heard this before, but just listen to what um, Saint Paul is asking us to do. He says, "Therefore, put on the armor of God, that you may be able to resist on the evil day, and having done everything, to hold your ground. So stand fast with fast with your loins girded in truth, clothed with righteousness as a breastplate." and your feet shod in readiness for the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, hold faith as a shield to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. 
I mean, he 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 puts these images out there for us, right? And we see this great spiritual battle. Yeah. And I and I th- what I, one of the things I love about that whole little passage there is it really does in a profound way prepare us for the world that we live in today, right? With the spiritual warfare that's going on, and and but 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 what I what I love about this. And I think what ties us into this idea of the of the thorns being the helmet of salvation is how he, he'll he'll say things like it's like we're we're getting ready for um, you know and your feet shod in readiness for the gospel of war and destruct no for the gospel of peace right it's just like it's like this sort of counterintuitive thing going on no oh, that's a great point and you know. We, in terms of our salvation, you know, we often seek our salvation in so many false crowns of the world. Uh, but, you know, this crown, the crown of thorns, I mean, that's that's the crown of our Savior, the King of the universe. We're, we're invited, you know, by priest, pro- by, we are priest, prophet, and king by our baptism, each one of us. We're, and that's us sharing in Christ's kingship. So he, we're baptized into his kingship. Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. And so in sharing his kingship and sharing his crown, you know, it is a crown of thorns. And so what we're, what we're hoping is, is that by the end of today's episode, you'll see your share in the crown of thorns as your helmet of salvation and that you'll welcome the crown of thorns as he welcomed That's the crown of thorns. That's a tough fruit to pray for, though. Yeah, well, and to choose it over all the cra- all, all the other crowns that the world has. It has there's some know, better ones out there. Like our, our human our human nature would tell us. Our fallen nature would tell us there's some really nice crowns out there. <laughs> well, that's one of the reasons why you know the mortification. They that taste comes like with chocolate. <laughs> you know, they they smell nice. <laughs> You know, and and th- those are the ones that are so like seductive. Like we we want we walk in that direction. Sure, but at the end of the day, you know, the, those thorns. If we al- allow ourselves to receive the crown of thorns, we're we're allowing ourselves to let it pierce us, to cut us deeply, to circumcise our minds, to mortify our minds, and prepare our minds to enter into the union into union with mind with the mind of Christ. Because you know, the things of the world they're not bad. But our desire for them are bad. How we value and think of them compared to uh, what their actual value is in the light of God. You know, we often fail to allow our minds to be mortified and corrected in the way that they ought to be. And so I think that's part of what the crown of thorns does. If we welcome it, it helps protect us from the lies of the world. Um it, well, and so I think we probably need to read the gospel passage before we go any further. Yeah, let's let's go to well. There's there's four different passages to choose from, yes. um, and we'll we'll do Matthew, uh, and so this is the 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 twenty seventh chapter of Matthew. And what's happening here is Jesus is being prepared for crucifixion. Mm-hmm. So it's not enough for them just to say, "All right, you know, uh, pick up a cross and and start going that way," you know, because there there's several people. Instead, listen to what they do to him. Yes. Right? And it says this, um, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus inside the praetorium and gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped off his clothes and threw a scarlet military cloak about him. Weaving a crown of a crown out of thorns, they placed it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat upon him and took the reed and kept striking him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the cloak, dressed him in his own clothes, and led him off to crucify him. Mm -hmm. They're essentially humiliating him. And they're trying to humiliate him with his claim of being a king. Well, and remember, our Lord is by nature and by right and birth, he is king of the universe. I mean, he's king. He's king. Um, now, he also becomes king by conquest. He also yeah. really uh, asserts that kingship uh, through his passion, through the conquest of the passion. But, you know, but also by nature, he was king. By being the only begotten son of God, uh, he was born into that. And and kings don't typically crown themselves uh but with the case of Jesus, there's some stories of people who have. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's true. That's true. But they're they're rarely the right ones. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And and in but in, in the case of Jesus, he would actually uniquely he would have had every right to crown himself. Like he literally he could have he could have uh, 
uh, chosen the most ostentatious, the most luxurious crown imaginable, no matter how many diamonds and, gem and gems that you add, no matter how pure, how beautiful, none of that could even begin to compare to his infinite glory, his infinite majesty. Nothing in creation compares to his infinite glory and his infinite majesty. And yet he did not crown himself. He, he in his humility, he waited. And he let us crown him. And so how did we crown him? We crowned him with a crown of thorns. And just as you read, Deacon Jeff, you know, we combine that with mockery and insults, yeah. beatings, scourgings, condemnations. We spat upon him. We rejected him. We asked Pilate to free Barabbas. We put a sign over him on the cross, mocking him, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And another gospel passage, we draped him in the color purple, the color of kings, as we crowned him with these crowned of thorns. You know, Behold the man, said Pilate, subjecting him all the more to more vitriol and hate and violence from us. And yet, as we discussed last week, he opened not his mouth. So what does this teach us? Yeah, we, that's, that's where we, we need to start to, again, this is not just about Jesus. Uh, it, it's really about us and what we take from this. Mm. It's really important for us that, that when we're meditating, we're not, I mean, like the idea, we, we look at the crown of thorns and we, we instantly think that, uh, uh, that the, the crown of thorns, like, well, that's an awful thing. Mm -hmm. It's torturous. It's it's so what Jesus did is so painful, and I love Jesus so much because he ha he endured all that pain for me, and it's all about his suffering and his pain and his discomfort and and people mocking him, and there's truth to all of that. Yeah, and yet there's um, there's like uh, this idea that this was all part of our salvation, mm -hmm. right? So so this this crown of thorns. This uh, this bloody kingship, as it were, uh, is 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 this is the helmet of salvation, right? Right. So we have to look and, f and 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 try to figure out like, well, why? Well, I think that one thing that comes to mind is there are so many crowns in this world, so many crowns that we're chasing after, but this crown of thorns is the only crown that lasts of all the crowns that the world has to offer. It's the only one that lasts. You know, heaven and earth are passed away, but my word will not pass away. And so I think the way that it becomes our helmet of salvation, this lasting crown, the crown of thorns, because it makes us vulnerable, yeah. as he did, by having a willingness to suffer. We are seeking first the kingdom with a capital K when we, we are seeking the crown that he received with the crowning of thorns seeking that which cannot rust or decay or be destroyed by others, and, and trusting that in Christ our weakness is our strength. You know, when Jesus is on the crown, when, I'm sorry, when Jesus is on the cross and he's beaten and he's bloody and he's got, you know, and he's being crowned and mocked and spat upon and hit with that reed, you know, he looks weak, but that's actually him at his strongest. Yeah. We're so caught up in the lies that the world teaches about what strength is and that Christ is inviting us to let go of all of that and to allow ourselves to step into that place of vulnerability. Yes. And that, again, that, and that's where this counterintuitive kind of counterculture idea comes because it's so often throughout salvation history. So as we're looking at the Bible and there are countless examples, but certainly uh, looking at say like, uh, well, you know, we started Lent and, and, and right at the beginning of Lent, we have the reading of the temptation of Jesus in the desert. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I remember going to school and uh, I'm glad I'm out of it, but you know, I remember as a kid. Remember Tom when 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 you'd have like a you knew today was a big test or whatever or some kind of big challenge or if you were getting ready for a big game or whatever, your mom would be like, "You need to eat a big breakfast. You need to be prepared. You need to you need to do all this uh, to to build your strength up, to build your mind up, to build your body up." And this is what the world tells. This is what our our bodies tell us, right? And 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 yet, you'd have thought that. Uh, you know, as Jesus was going into the desert to be tempted by the devil, that maybe the Blessed Mother would have said, "Oh, you need to eat a uh, you need to eat a big breakfast, Jesus, to be ready for this, because you're going it's going to be forty days. You're going to get you know you need to you need to prepare yourself." And so, how does he prepare? 
for the devil, he's 40 days of fasting. Right. Right. So there's there's the strength of emptying. Mm. So in the emptying is the strength. That's where the strength is found. And I've always contended that what that means is like when we empty ourselves of those things, the things that we think that give us strength, the reality is when we empty ourselves, we then become vessels that can be filled by Jesus, that can be filled by the power of God. We're emptying ourselves unto the fullness of him. That's right. right. We're making ourselves available at that point. And that's what the vulnerability is all about. Um, and, and, you know, there's like this idea of this military leader that Jesus was, you know, meek and humble riding on a donkey, right, right into town. It's like, wait, this is our savior? He's riding a donkey. Right. You know, and it's like, it just seems counterintuitive. It's like, that's not what it's supposed to be. And yet, what it actually is, is even more powerful than all of the evil could ever imagine. When you bring up an important point with the uh, with the devil uh, tempting Jesus uh in the in the desert because the third temptation uh the devil promises him all the kingdoms of the world yeah right and and when you read that you're like what you know the, the devil doesn't have the ability to give that and it's like actually if you think about it yeah he did he, he did because if you look at revelation 12 it doesn't say that when uh, Michael and the and the good angels cast the 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 the, the rebel, rebellious angels out of heaven that they went to hell. It said it sent them down to earth. Yeah, mm-hmm. where he would reign. Where he would <laughs> reign. So this is literally when Jesus took on flesh and dwelt among us. He was actually infiltrating the devil's dominion, mm-hmm. and and the devil was like. Basically, what he's saying is you you can you don't have to go on that cross. You don't have to you know suffer. Right. You know I don't know necessarily the devil, uh, the extent to which he knew what was going to come and how uh, Jesus would save us. But ultimately, he was saying I can make this easy on you. You know right. you want the crowns, you can have it as long as you worship me. I'll give you all the crowns. And so when we chase after crowns of this world, we're literally you know we're falling into that temptation that the devil tempted Jesus. Mm-hmm. And the, the true crown is the crown of thorns. And that's the helmet of our salvation. Right, and and it's not the obvious one. Uh, you know, what did uh, Indiana Jones have to do when he picked the cup of Christ, right? right. And from the Last Supper, it's there were all these ones and, and all the people that had chosen like the he fancy, well. right. You, he chose poorly, you know, <laughs> you know, and then someone, you know, Indiana Jones uh, chose wisely. Right. Uh, and, and, and what was it? It was the, like the most, like the Simple. cup of a carpenter, I think is what he says in that movie. Yeah. And it's the thing that doesn't look like the obvious choice that the world values. The world thinks is the, is the kingly, uh, the kingly cup, you know, and so the kingly crown um, when someone, you know, with this, in, these images of, of the breastplate and, and the clothe yourself in righteousness, all these things that St. Paul's speaking of, we have images of military might and this strong, you know, uh, uh, hard metal or whatever and these great spears and, and certainly this helmet that's going to protect us, that, that covers our head and would protect us from any evil, you know, attack on us. And the reality is that that helmet is 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 vulnerability that the helmet is is the uh, is a crown that's uh, woven together out of thorns that that actually hurts to wear yeah yes no that's a huge point i mean it cuts us like we were saying earlier it circumcises the mind mortifies the mind and it protects us from the lies of the enemy and, and i think the protection there comes from like when you were talking about the the cup you know in indiana jones yeah which uh I, I, <laughs> good holy movie yes yeah, very religious that's where i get all my theology from from that movie <laughs> but the, the point is though is that the reason that that was uh, a fitting moment in indiana jones is that carpenter's cup uh it, it reminds us of the humility of Christ and the word humility, the root word, root word of humility is humus, which means of the earth. Right. Right. And so, like when people says that that guy's really down to earth, that's another way of saying that that, that person is humble. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. And so, like Jesus, who is infinitely high, he's literally the most high. Yeah. <laughs> right. He came and taking on flesh. He basically he went so low. He went past us. He truly went to the earth. Right, you know, know that know that you are dust, and to dust that you shall return. Right, he's the most humble of all because he emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave. But the the thing that uh, that's 
powerful about humility, because we were talking about just a second ago, how the lies of the enemy, the crowning of thorns by accepting it, it protects us from the lies of the enemy. Humility protects us from the lies of the enemy. When we give into our pride, we're basically just opening up a door and letting the, the enemy walk right in. But what we're doing is when we when we mortify our pride, and especially our, our mind is the thing that kind of just makes the decisions as to what we're going to be letting in and how yeah. we're going to use our time. We got to kind of begin with our mind. And, you know, and so, and I'll go back to what we we mentioned and we talked about it in our our last show, uh, and you mentioned it again here and harkened back to the fact that Jesus opened not his mouth, and and there's a part of that that's not just that he was silent. Is it that he willingly accepted this? Right. It's this sort of docility that just says, hey, do what you must do. Right. Right. And so the thing is, for us to wear this crown of thorns, we're not crowning ourselves. We're allowing ourselves to wear a crown of salvation. Yes. When we're, we're being open to it. And that's what changes everything. Because as soon as we have pride... I'm going to put me on this crown and I'm going to I'm going to hurt and this is going to be great. Right. Right. As soon as we've done that, then we look in the mirror and see it was some big shiny gold crown. Right. That was that had no lasting value that had no effectiveness. Right. We go like, but I thought I was putting a crown of thorns on. It's like, yeah, but see, here's the thing. This has got to be a willingness to accept the suffering, a willingness to accept the being downtrodden, a willingness uh, to, uh, to to be humble. You bring up a huge point because with the will and the willingness, the will, he willed this. Because I had just said, you know, we, it, it, it begins with the mind. But really, I mean, one of the things that we were emphasizing last week was that relationship between the will, the mortified will and the, and the, and the mind that's sufficiently healed so it can be guided by reason. So, yeah, it's both and. It's not – you can't be humble – while your while your will is flying all over the fl- place, fly, following all of its appetites, that needs to be brought That's down right. to submission too. If that crown is going to have, if the crowning of thorns is going to have kingship over us, you know, then the will has to get submitted as well. And again, we see evidence throughout all of church history. But think about, think about like something like I, I've been to Lourdes uh, uh, several times, and when I go there, it, it never ceases to amaze me that this basically this sweet little. Uh, innocent, really illiterate mm-hmm. girl in a backwoods town in France. I mean, Lourdes was nowhere. Right. It was it was nowheresville. I mean, it's just like not a destination on any map. Um, and so you can't he, get there from here. And so Mary appeared to Bernadette, and, and and so much so that like when Bernadette goes and does what is supposed to happen, like I'm going to go tell my bishop, and then it's like what, why, why, who? go away you know right. there's this there's this like you aren't some great scholar some great learned person or a man right you're this little girl who doesn't have an education out collecting firewood in a swampy area and this is who mary is going to appear to mm. uh, and you and you think all throughout history who the saints are the the, the, the are the examples are just um uh forever in terms of like uh who god will use and 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 the weakest and the most vulnerable and the most humble among us are the most powerful witnesses Mm -hmm. to his glory again i think it's because i don't want to presume but i I really do think it's like that in our humility and our worthlessness right we don't deserve jesus in our willingness to empty ourselves and again willingness to empty ourselves then we permit, we allow God to fill us. Right. And we invite him into that empty space so that we then become vessels of authority and power and grace and mercy, and God works through us. And, again, then in that situation, if we're looking in a mirror, we go like, oh, I'm wearing a crown of thorns. Mm. And, like, I, I, I didn't put that on myself. God allowed me to have the opportunity, to, the, the willingness to accept it. Yeah, and, and, and to let people, and this also includes, you know, part of the Beatitudes is, is blessed are you who are persecuted for my yes. sake. Uh, allowing our, we live in a time where a lot of folks are pointing fingers at each other and getting offended. Our part, instead of allowing ourselves to play into that and get offended on behalf of Jesus, what, instead what we can do is focus on saying, okay, I'm getting attacked right now, but really it's our Lord who's being attacked. And I want to I want to receive this attack in union with him. I want to have a, a, a mind that's united with Christ 
by the by the mortifying power of this this crown of thorns. I'll let them place it upon me, and I'm gonna Lord give me the grace to love them as you love mm, us. Yeah. And, and you loved those who were persecuting you and crucifying you. A love that has no self-centeredness, no self-entitlement, a self-sacrificing witness of his love to the world. That's the thing that's going to transform the world. And that's going to be the thing that, that, that's our helmet of salvation. I mean, that's the thing that ultimately is the mark of a, of a life well lived as a willingness to submit to his passion because that is the path by which our own personal resurrection happens and we as catholics when we when we do the when we physically do the the sign of the cross we touch our forehead and then our stomach and our shoulders we're actually putting ourselves on a cross yes i mean we're we're, we're, so this is this is what we do as catholics this is this is we we have to welcome we have to welcome the crown of thorns uh, to be willing to wear the crown of thorns and so that's why praying this particular sorrowful mystery this third sorrowful mystery is really so powerful uh, in, in, in the fruit that's born. I mean, our salvation is born in this particular uh, fruit. And, and, and that's a great thing to, um, to be contemplating, to meditate upon uh, as we enter into the great mysteries of the rosary. And certainly as we, welcome, um, uh, as we welcome the Lord into our lives in a way that's transformative, right? That's so beautiful. And then to have, uh, you know, his blessed mother, to have Mary there at our side to guide us along in this process is such a great gift to each one of us. And so let's ask her to intercede on our behalf. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary mother, mother of God, God pray, pray for, for us sinners, sinners now and at the hour, hour of our death. death. Amen. Amen. Thanks for listening to The Catholic Cafe. If you'd like to contact Deacon Jeff, send him an email at deaconjeff at thecatholiccafe.com. Visit us on the web at thecatholiccafe.com. You can also find us on iTunes or follow us on Facebook and Twitter. The Catholic Cafe is brought to you by the Order of Malta Federal Association. Join us again at the Catholic Cafe, serving up salvation one cup of coffee at a time.